Welcome to episode number 268 of this great episode of Destination Linux. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Jill. I'm Ryan. And I'm Michael. On this week's episode of Destination Linux, we're going to be d discussing free as in freedom, not free as in beer. And we ask the question, is it okay for developers to charge for their work? Then we're going to take a look at a new partnership Canonical has with Vodafone. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All this and much more coming up right now on Destination Linux to keep those penguins marching. This week in our community feedback, we get an email from Kevin who writes us to say, Hello, DLN Podcast. I'm writing in about episode 247. I haven't been a listener for long, and I usually have just been picking up the new episodes when they air on Spotify, but I like to go back to older episodes to hear them as well. I think DLN does an amazing podcast, and it's such a pleasure to listen to such good Linux coverage. First of all, now my ears are completely open to any questions you have. <laughs> you have properly complimented. No, thank you so much for that. I really, really do appreciate that. And I love that we still have so many new listeners coming on board. Uh, they go on to say, it does make me sad to hear about the decline of Firefox, but I was interested with something that was brought up in that conversation. I think it was Michael that was saying something like, Firefox should stick to free speech and privacy and stop with the politics and keep the politics out of it. Well, I appreciate taking credit for things that I didn't have to do. Uh, this in this case, I did not actually do that. that thing, I'm pretty sure that was Ryan saying it. No, but, that uh, sounds like a Jill thing uh, to say. It could have sure. been. been. Totally a Jill know. thing. I don't know. But yes, that was definitely <laughs> probably me. It sounds very much like me. Yeah. Uh, go, goes on to say, and it got me thinking, I wonder if it isn't the lack of politics that made the older Firefox great. I think there was all these politics there, but what that they have changed. What I mean is, as Linux users, I think we all chose Linux over using Windows, at least partially because of our politics. We like freedom of speech and we like privacy. I think during that conversation that DLN hit the nail on the head, Firefox politics have changed for the worst. Kevin also went on to mention the fact there are politics in Linux as well with the philosophy of open source in general um, and finishes with, I hope I wrote a coherent email. I'm not the best writer. I think you did fantastic and amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you think about this? So first, I love your email from beginning to end. Uh, it's a fantastic question. I have so many things to say on this topic. When we were doing a pre-show, I think I had a paragraph page full. Of yeah, you had a lot. Yes, he did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then they're like, Ryan, can you cut it back a little bit? Because this is something I'm very, very passionate about. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, there's truth in the statement that things like freedom, security, privacy are political, right? You could definitely make that case. When I think about freedom, security, privacy, I think of those things, though, as human rights, guaranteed, uncompromising, despite any political affiliations. And so a lot of times when you hear political, you instantly in the US, especially because it's so divisive here, you think about a side. But I think these things are agnostic to any side or political discussion. They're just human right issues altogether. Jill, what do you think? Absolutely, Ryan. And speaking about Firefox, Firefox has really done so much for privacy and security over the years. And we can't forget that. You know, it's important, really important to keep things in context with decisions they make, which we might not agree with. But recently, Firefox has really bounced back and is focusing so much more on security and privacy. They've got their focus back in the correct way now. And they've introduced so many uh, amazing uh, new security and privacy technologies. Like there's a new sandboxing technology called RL Box. And this actually, RL Box prevents untrusted code and other security vulnerabilities from causing accidental defects as well as supply chain attacks. And it helps harden Firefox against potential security vulnerabilities in third party libraries. Mm -hmm. And also, site isolation is enabled to better protect users against side channel attacks like the 
like the infamous Spectra vulnerability. So a lot of good things have changed in Fire, Firefox, particularly you know in the last six months or so. Yeah, really I, good. I think it's also important to note that we did that episode on two forty seven, uh, you know, many many months ago, and yeah. since then Firefox has changed quite a bit. They have improved a lot of the stuff. Now, in terms of the politics thing, I completely agree with Ryan. The politics that you know, we were talking about is kind of like on par with just. It's not really even politics. It should be, and it, it doesn't. It shouldn't matter what affiliation it is. But I also want to say that I don't think Firefox has changed its politics because I just think people have been paying attention to it more, you know, because they've been kind of the same uh, opinion on certain things for a long time. But I do mm-hmm. think that focusing more on what the the purpose of the goal of Firefox is is the open web and making sure everybody has access to a quality browser. And I think that's the more important thing. And Firefox has been doing that recently and they've been adding a ton of features like Jill said, also the total cookie protection feature. Mm, and it's great. They also introduced yeah. a, the, uh, it's a really, really powerful uh, privacy feature called network partitioning, which improves the privacy while browsing the web by partitioning the network resources instead of sharing them for across different websites. So it el- essentially it eliminates cross site tracking so for example like some people would be using the uh, cache or the images or something else and it being on the browser's cache and being able to detect like what domain was was hosting those particular images or those uh, that cache and that's now being blocked with this network partitioning so this that feature is a very powerful thing to eliminate that sort of stuff so i think that they are pushing forward on privacy security a lot more recently and i think that the the path that they are taking is overall good. They just had like some hiccups back in, the, in at that point. So we were kind of more worried about where they were going. But now I think that they have made some good changes in terms of what their direction is. You know, when I think about Linux back in the day, I think a lot of people chose Linux because they like hacking or for privacy, security reasons, those type of things. And there were a lot of reasons why Linux, especially back then, wasn't as good of a desktop choice. I'm talking back in the day as, say, a Windows or a Mac OS. Now, Linux is one of those things, not only do you get privacy and security, but I feel in many instances, if not the majority of them, Linux is actually just a better operating system than the other choices out there. Mm -hmm. Firefox is back, I think, in the situation Linux was many years ago, where you're not choosing Firefox because it's necessarily the fastest. There are times where they come out with technologies that make it as fast, but it's generally slightly behind there. You're not necessarily choosing it because it has the best fundamental design. Now that's up to people's personal opinions. Some people like the look of Chrome more, some people like the more Firefox or for the standardization piece would be a big one for developers. A lot of developers, uh, website designers will use Chrome because that's what the majority of the market users. So what does Firefox provide? Well, it provides that privacy and security. And I think the point is that that's that's the niche they need to stick to. And when we were talking mm-hmm. back then about them going into other political things, it starts to distract from what the core reason is people choose Firefox today. They're not choosing it necessarily because it has it's better than all the browsers out there. They're choosing it for that privacy and security portion, that niche portion that they do so well. I'm not saying they don't do well in some of those other things, but they're certainly always going to be in a keep up situation with Chrome and stuff just because of the amount of money other companies are are delving into it. And I think as long as Firefox stays on that and you and Jill gave brilliant examples of how that's the case, I think Firefox has a chance to continue to compete against these other browsers. Yeah, totally agree. And also, an additional to the the concept of that they are kind of behind in the speed. They are they're pushing a lot more now for that sort of thing, which is great. But the privacy and security thing are one of the main things that I wanted to use uh, Firefox when it was first out. I think it was I actually think it was, I was using it when it was Phoenix, like many years ago. Yeah, because I didn't want to use <laughs> Internet Explorer for at the time. And I, I stuck with it because of its philosophy, because of its privacy security, because of the fact that it's open source and focused on those things. And that's one of the things is why I still use it. But also, container tabs are amazing. 
Mm-hmm. Container I, tabs. I, just, I mean, it's yeah, all about that's container funny. tabs. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, as yeah. as a feature wise, I have like kind of like yes, Chrome has some benefits here and there. Chromium's based browsers as well. You know, those there are things, but container tabs are so awesome that it it doesn't really even matter if like Firefox is slightly slower. That's such a cool feature that I'm going to continue container to use. Container tabs it, is the biggest know? selling point. Yeah, it's one of the greatest features yeah. they have for sure. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for sending this email. We love hearing from our worldwide community. What we want you to do is get your official deal in mug, fill it with some coffee or bubbly, sit down on the nearest stool or chair and send an email to comments at destinationlinux.org. Want to join in on the community discussion? Then join the deal in community forum by going to dealinforum.com. And just to throw back to last week, Michael, you didn't edit out the section where I made fun of stools in there, and I'm so no. proud of you. I went back and looked myself, so you didn't try to hide the proof of it, and I just want to tell you, I'm proud of you. I'm Thank proud you. of Thank you for you. that. I yeah. think I also <laughs> added a joke in there about, like, I think I even added a part and at the end of it with an outtake. For those who didn't watch it, there was an outtake of us discussing whether or not I was going to keep it. But you did see the scene where yes. you looked down the second I mentioned it, didn't you? Did you see that when you were editing? I, I noticed that it. I noticed that it looked <laughs> like that, but I guarantee you, I was not doing it for that reason. We caught him red-handed, Jill. <laughs> yes, we, we did. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I was not doing it for that reason. Okay. Now, I've, and also, I'm not doing it now for that reason. Oh, look! 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 He's looking down, Jill. He did it again. <laughs> oh no. Busted. <laughs> Busted. Well, something that is also something I'm totally never going to pretend I'm not doing, and that is using DigitalOcean because they are awesome, and they are these this episode's a sponsor, so check it out. Go to, go to do.co slash tux2022. That is the new URL, and the reason why we're talking about it is because DigitalOcean is fantastic. It is a cloud computing service, and you know, cloud computing can say, it can be com- complex, but it doesn't have to be. Standing up reliable, affordable cloud infrastructure doesn't have to be complex because that is what digital Ocean offers you get and you can enjoy a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most building world changing apps that grow your business. With DigitalOcean, you also get predictable pricing, robust product docs. The amount of tutorials that are available on DigitalOcean is just astounding. There's tons of great stuff. And there's the services that developers love is at DigitalOcean. So you can you also can get support at every stage of growth, whether you have teams of one person to teams of a thousand people. With simple, powerful cloud computing, you get all of this at DigitalOcean. And as a listener of the Dest- Destination Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's even better than free. You, for DigitalOcean, you is going to give you a one hundred dollar free credit when you sign up at do.co slash tux twenty twenty two. Again, that's do.co slash tux twenty twenty two. We changed the URL for tux for many reasons, but the reference is is that tux is the mascot for the, the Linux. The, the, <laughs> that's the name of the mascot. So again, go to get started for one a one hundred dollar free credit. A, yes, one hundred dollar free credit. When you go to do.co slash tux2022 to get support this awesome service and be able to get so many great benefits of creating your cloud platform on such an awesome service. So thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. And yeah, so speaking of DigitalOcean and a place to put all your software you work very hard on, you know, that leads us into our main topic, which is Linux is free as in freedom, not free as in beer. We are... So lucky to have so many talented and dedicated coders who work on our favorite open source software day in and day out. And many of those who contribute not only have families, have chores, have parents to take care of, but also work full-time jobs. Then they come home and work on code that benefits the entire world, (laughs) literally. (laughs) And so so today we wanted to talk about the word free when discussing Linux or other open source software. There is a saying many in the community use that we stated earlier, Linux is free as in freedom, not free as in beer. (laughs) So so Ryan, what are your thoughts? (laughs) Well, this is something that's been going on since I've joined Linux, what, five, six years ago now, of this constant kind of back and forth of should we, can we charge for software? I've seen certain projects come in and decide they're going to start certain developers charge for projects. And I've seen them get a lot of backlash from this. 
What's interesting is I went to gnu.org slash philosophy slash selling and looked at their philosophy that they laid out from the Free Software Foundation. And they you can go look at this on your own time, but they explicitly talk about the fact that they have no issues at all with charging. In fact, encourage it because the idea of this free and open source is that this developer may package it for somebody and charge that, but because the code's out there, anybody can go grab it and then make it and compile it themselves to use the software. So you still have that component where you're closing the digital divide, which when you talk about benefiting the whole world, that's one of the big benefits out there that we talk about a lot with open source is closing that digital divide. People don't have the financial capabilities to go and pay for a 3D modeler that's $1,000 can go use Blender for free, for instance. So even from the beginning philosophies of open source software, there's this agreement that charging is okay. But as a community, I think there's a lot of people still pushing back on this. And the question is, what as a community are we obligated to contribute? It's important to remember that developers, first of all, don't owe us anything. And mm -hmm. I think that's the number one thing that we have to keep in mind. I see some of these emails and responses of people to developers and it's like, look, they're doing this voluntarily. You know, mm -hmm. you can't get that mad or angry or be so upset when you're not contributing. Um, but it's not just financial. Some people can't contribute financial. I think it's bug reporting. I mm -hmm. think it's testing. I think it's doing things within your skill set to help these projects out if you can't financially. But I don't think we could hold anybody uh, or be upset with any developers who decide that they want to charge for their packages. There's nothing about the philosophy of free and open source that's against that. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind. Yeah, I think that that's very mm -hmm. important. And it's also important to, to contribute in many ways. And even just sending a thank you to a developer is something mm -hmm. that is not very, very often received and will be great to receive. A lot of developers don't know how many people are actually using their software, for example. So getting that kind of feedback is very valuable. I mean, it's it's like when people leave comments on our, our episodes and are on our videos on our channels. We appreciate that because we see a number, but we don't know. We don't have, we know it's a way for us to interact with the people people who are watching it other than the comments and stuff like that and being on the, the forums. So just doing that sort of stuff has a lot more value than you might think it does. So like the even clicking the like button, for example, is something that helps us know that people are appreciative of the, the stuff. The email we got at the mm -hmm. beginning, yeah, thanking exactly. us for the show and all of that, yeah. that makes all the difference. And to a developer out there, let me tell you something, 99, if not 100%, frankly, of the emails they get are but either bug reports and they could be nicely written or issues or things like that. Take the time. If you're using a package, you can't donate financially. You don't have the time to do a bug report. You don't have the time for that stuff to at least send a thank you letter to the developer saying, thank you so much for the software. This is what I use it for. It means the world to me. I remember when we got an email one time mm -hmm. from truckers that were out there. We got, we got yeah. a, a, a whole series from truckers that were saying, Hey, you know, you help make the long haul of trucking from state to state so nice with your podcast. It keeps me awake. It keeps me entertained. It keeps me laughing. Like that meant the world to us. That stuck Absolutely. with me. And that was from years ago, by the way, when that whole like series of trucker emails and stuff came, but it's still with me today is the first thing that comes to mind. That stuff makes a difference. It makes a difference to us and it definitely makes a difference to developers. Yeah, absolutely. And especially the financial aspect of it. I mean, there's a very commonly expressed concept of saying that it's not open source if it charges money. Right? There's a lot of people who have said that. And I think that that's actually kind of a contrary to what is really important about the development of it, because funding is necessity for the development, because like Linux is an open source platform at its core. But it also needed funding of foundations and corporations and stuff like that for it to thrive. It would not have thrived without that money. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it would not absolutely. be where it's at if those corporations and individuals did not donate actual money because not everybody's in this, uh, a situation where they can donate. So moving that aside, that financially you can't, and that's a completely different for sure. scenario. Financially mm -hmm. you can. It's very important that you do because money to the open source software and developers makes it so that one day that developer, even if it's a few dollars, because if it's a bunch of people that use this package and it's just a few dollars a month that you're giving something like that, it can mean the difference where they could quit that full-time job and then spend their entire time. And we've seen this happen in open source communities 
uh, multiple times, spend their entire time working on the software, making it better for everybody out there. And to me, that's the ideal state. If there's a piece of software in Linux that's that important, we should be all as a community looking to financially back that so we can get that full-time dedication from that developer and even hiring other people potentially on that team to develop it out there. Um, a lot of people just talk about do bug reports and things. I think that is important, but mm -hmm. I think we have to emphasize for anybody capable, if you are making money, especially off an open source project, mm -hmm. if you have a YouTube channel, you're using Blender, you're using Caden Live, you're using OBS, I think you should be financially giving money back from the money that you're making to those projects because without them, you wouldn't have a show. You wouldn't have ability to do stuff. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. There are some in the community, uh, some projects that have have tried different ways of receiving, you know, donations and funding. And uh, one of the the really progressive ones out there was Elementary OS. Yes, um, they, you know, were were trying to find a way to give back to developers. And so in the Elementary OS Juno release back in October 2018, Elementary set up a button prompt in their App Store, App Center store to get donations for open source software. And you can donate any amount you wanted or just type zero in the custom field for any software downloaded. This actually unfortunately met with some pushback from users, but I thought it was a brilliant way to pay back developers. And I think it should be, you know, universally part of all our uh, software packages and software stores. I agree. They pioneered yeah. this, and I think yeah. it's brilliant. So when you go to Elementary's page to download it, the option is to pay some money, $5 for the entire OS, $10, whatever. You can click custom, and you could put zero. It doesn't explicitly mm -hmm. tell you that's an option necessarily. Yeah. But as soon as you put zero in there, you can click download. Their app store in elementary works very similar. So they have a curated software store that they have packages that they curate, want you to look at, they think are some of the best software packages out there in the various categories. You click in there and you'll see, you know, for a certain software, uh, $10, $5, you can click on that. That's the recommended donation. Uh, you could choose zero. So again, the people who aren't financially capable of doing it can put zero and download it. Um, people who want to try it out first can put zero and download it. And then during the update process, I believe it may prompt you again at certain times uh, to donate to that software as well. I think they're pioneers in it. And I think this is something like you said, Jill, brilliantly. I think we should put it, I think every distro should utilize mm -hmm. a, a system like this because frankly, a lot of times I forget myself even to donate to some of these packages that I'm using so yeah. having that reminder there would be like, oh, yeah, I've been using this for six months now and I love it. Let me give them 10 bucks um, to show my appreciation and things. But I think elementary were the pioneers in this and they definitely shouldn't have gotten pushback for it by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. They should be praised for it because they created a very innovative system. Yeah, absolutely. And Wikipedia, too. They're, you know, they ask frequently for, for donations right when you go to a, yep. a page of a search you're looking for. And, you know, I just donate five dollars like um, like every every uh, month or so, <laughs> because but they prompt me to remind me, <laughs> yep. please please donate. You know we're a small team and we need help. <laughs> so I mean it's a great that's a great example of like the <laughs> like some people talk about calling it nagware where it's just nagging you to do, to pay for it. So there are some software that actually uses that as a method of getting people to pay for it, and I yeah. think that's totally fine, especially if the price is reasonable. And in the case of elementary, it's you know you pay whatever you want, and that also yeah. applies to the applications in the App Center. And if you are if you're able to pay five dollars, that's better than nothing, and it will go towards the you know the the funding of being able to build the software that you're using. So I think that's totally fine. But also the mention of the Wikipedia thing. That is something that is so funny <laughs> because I don't even think about it. Wikipedia is something that everybody uses in yeah. the world, and it's so important, and it's very valuable. And some people make jokes about how you can edit things, and it, you can't actually edit it that much. Like It's, you know. Anyway, there is times where, you know, once a year at least, they will do this like kind of crowdfunding campaign thing, and then they will ask you like, hey, you have donated this amount previously. Would you like to donate this same amount or another amount and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Like that is a good approach as well because it just reminds people to do it. It's the same kind of thing that a lot of people hate 
that especially people who are creators on YouTube, they hate saying subscribe and you know remember to subscribe yeah. and click the like button and all that stuff. <laughs> and people don't like saying it and people don't like hearing it. However, it the reason why it's done is because people just don't remember to do it because it's not something that they're thinking about. The reason it's done because it actually works. We yes, yeah, that little works. stupid box that comes up and it clicks the click in YouTube. You get so, more subscribers. It's weird because yep. it annoys yeah. all of us, but it works. Yeah. Uh, I, I like I like the prompting for it. I don't think we should be rebuking any developer who decides to charge for extra for features or advanced versions of their software. Oh, yeah. In fact, sure. I think it should be encouraged in that way. So you have a, a version of the OS that's free, but maybe if they curate a bunch of packages and things for you, they charge you $10 for that yeah, version. Yeah, like Eldorin does it. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a brilliant way of doing things as mm -hmm. well. And again, you're not losing the importance of closing the digital divide with this. You're just making sure that people put value to things in there. And I learned this early on when I was in a, a board game development company and they wanted to go to a conference and hand out a bunch of CDs for free of the game. And so we did this on the first day. And the next day we noticed all these CDs were in the trash. We found tons of them sitting in trash cans. People would grab it, they would take it and then throw it in the trash. So then the next day we decided we're going to charge a dollar for each copy of it. And there were no more CDs in the trash. Yeah. So there was suddenly value now yeah, put definitely. to this thing, right? <laughs> and, and that was very important. Even if it's a small amount, when she put value to something, suddenly they're not going to throw that dollar away in the trash, right? It means something a little different to them. Yeah, that's a great point, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Michael, when you look at the word free, you have gone on a little bit of a rant mm -hmm. in the past with this. Just, just, just a tiny bit on the soapbox <laughs> tiny, from time to time. Tiny one, maybe. And, you know, yeah. we, we've heard the saying and stuff, but tell me why you, you don't like this term free and why you think this itself drives some of this behavior we see in the community at times. So... The free term is something that kind of bothers me. Like, and in some ways, the open source term bothers me too because it's kind of confusing and it's not something people would actually automatically understand. And pe but, the, but the reason why I don't like the free term is because, well, people think they understand it, but they don't. And that's the whole process of the like the title of the episode. You know, free is in freedom, not free is in beer. That sort of thing is the that's a problem because you have to explain what the word means when you say it. If you have to explain it, it's not a good way of calling it something. It's not a good term. So, uh, like, yeah. the, the thing I don't like about it is that, you know, 99% of the people who hear it, maybe 100% of the people who hear free software originally, they think it means costing nothing to them. Because that's what the word free means. So the free software term just implies that. You know, mm -hmm. and, it, and the word free means freedom and gratis both at the same time. And trying to change the minds of everyone on something like this is just a lost cause, in my opinion. Especially when you have companies giving away software <laughs> that is proprietary and also calling it free software because they give it for free, gratis. There are yeah. countless of examples of that kind of thing happening. So free software kind of competes with the same term of free software that... And, and, and one of those is what people think it means. So it just kind of creates this needless like argument or trying to having to explain what it means every single time you say it. It it's removes just value not too. Like yeah. we were talking about with the CDs, it removes value from it because people are assuming, the, first of all, in the privacy and security world, what's the saying that we, we try to get people on board with? If it's free, you are the product. Yes, okay, exactly. So, mm -hmm. This yeah. is a really bad saying when you now look and you compare that to, by the way, you should use Linux, it's free, uh, because they're going to be like, well, then I'm the product, right? So they, they're not uh. understanding the differences necessarily between those two. And that can be that can be extraordinarily damaging um, to, to Linux as a whole, because corporations and things we know are starting to pick up on Linux. But for a long time, they were hesitant because they thought, well, if this thing's free, we've heard this from many developers we interview, if this thing's free, yep. then I'm not going to put this in my business and have an entire business, millions of dollars potentially riding on something that I can't guarantee is going to be developed tomorrow because there's no money in there. There's no company backing it. There's no big thing there. Um, so I think that is a really important point you just made there. The free software thing has many facets of just confusion, plus also like that you know semblance of not even being good. But uh, I have actually some suggestions of what could be used. So maybe this could be changed. Maybe this could be used to share Shareware. around the community. N no. 
that oh. already exist too. Uh, oh, darn. So <laughs> originally, I would think that software freedom is better than free software, but my preference of term to use mm-hmm. is Libra software or Libre software because it is very much more clear about what it means. And for people yeah. who don't understand it, the biggest power of this term is that they don't know what it means. They're not going to assume what it means. Whereas free software, they assume it means free as in gratis. No, they'll just assume it's Nacho yeah. Libre. You they're, know, yes, they're going to assume libre. it is Nacho Libre. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so the, the word Libre or Libra is in a ton of different languages already. It's in like 20 or something, and it all means the same thing. It just means liberty. So it's very, if you look it up, it's very clear that Libre or Libra means freedom and liberty liberty is so it libre or libra which one is depends on the, on the <laughs> language everybody <laughs> pronounces it differently you know <laughs> yeah. i already have a problem with pronunci pronunciating words just like that uh and, and so when people when people are supposed to be the experts that i copy use two different versions it really messes me up uh, so we need to decide yeah. it here is it libre or libra so we're gonna problem, make the decision the problem with that. it is that it's the english version is libra and the Spanish version is Libre. Libre, and you, you yeah. you more often see people saying Libre because it's more commonly used, whereas Libra is almost never used in terms of English language. Yeah. So that's kind of why. But it is technically both, depending on what language, although I think Libre is the more commonly accepted. From so, the South, you can't mess with me like this. You got to pick <laughs> one. It's Libra. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with everyone. It's Libra from now on. <laughs> If you want to go with Libra, that's fine. Yeah. Whatever. All right. Oh. Good. But I like and I like that as a as a topic because it covers the the it explains the free the Very freedom pas- aspect, but it also removes the con- the confusion as well, and that is one of the biggest issues that I had with the original term. So floss instead of foss. Floss. <laughs> free Libra free open Libra. source software. I love it. Of- there you go. And Dennis will love it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis will so love I, it too. I, I want to read from the GNU.org philosophy thing to kind of wrap this up a little bit. Is It says, many people believe that the spirit of GNU project is that you should not charge money for distributing copies of software or that you should charge as little as possible just to cover the cost. This is a misunderstanding. Actually, we encourage people who redistribute free software to charge as much as they wish or can. If a license does not permit users to make copies and sell them, it is a non-free license. If this seems surprising to you, read on. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. But I think, again, it's really important to understand fundamentally, foundationally, this was never a thing. It somehow became a thing in certain portions of the community. Not all, because the Linux community is so giving, but in some. And then finally, Michael, I want to mention that our patrons are wondering when you're going to segue to the DLN store as a way to support <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right now, DaleInStore.com. Yeah. You can get yeah, awesome you swag. <laughs> no, we're teasing, we're teasing, we're teasing. Um, but I, I really I really think it's important. Number one, if you can, give money to these projects, uh, especially ones that may not be as obvious in the background that we utilize that are so important uh, to the underlying features that we love about Linux. Number two, if you can't, then you should be looking to donate something with your skill set. That could be as simple as a thank you note, number one, but even as simple as bug reporting, those things do help. But again, if you're making money off free and open source software, for the companies out there especially making money off free and open source software, you need to be handing out some money. Quit being cheap. Don't be a Michael. Wow. Wow. Oh, oh, I was was like on a campaign right there. I felt it just come through like, don't be a Michael. That that could be a slogan for legal I am not cheap. I'm a financial minimalist. It's very and different. Also, we we got to remember another way to contribute to open source software is with just passing it on. You know, putting it on a flash drive, giving it to someone, a Promote Linux it. distribution, yeah. promoting it, marketing it, helping with social me- social media. So if you don't have the finances, there are ways to contribute to open source. But many of us Linux and open source software users love to contribute to our favorite open source projects as much as we can. So if you have the funds and have been on the fence about contributing to your favorite open source project financially, we encourage you to do so, as this will help Linux and open source thrive and grow and show the developers how much they really are appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. 
And and one more uh, tip here during Halloween, I give Arch out on USB discs, no candy from my house. Now, I don't have as many <laughs> Halloweeners as I've had in the prior years. That's a great way for yeah. people to stop I'm showing up to your house. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's got a dual benefit there. <laughs> Perfect. Now, another amazing open source project out there that we want to talk about is Bitwarden. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. You want to use the slash DLN because that tells them <laughs> we sent you there. It's very important. A password manager software allows you to have peace of mind knowing your online accounts are secure. I take Bitwarden with me everywhere. I have it on my phone. I have it on my laptops and all the various distros. And you all know how many laptops I have. It's really important, as much as I distro hop, to have all my passwords in one safe place. And that is Bitwarden. It provides you tools to store all your passwords in a secure vault, auto-generate those passwords for you, even automatically fill them in. It makes life so much easier. You can access your data across all the devices we mentioned, plus the command line as well. Bitwarden also seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your device. So you know you're the only person with access to your data. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free, but you can also check out their $10 a year premium account. You're going to get one gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, so it also has the 2FA authentication built in, priority customer support, and so much more. You get all of this for less than a dollar per month. We love Bitwarden. We used Bitwarden before they ever became a sponsor, but we're so glad they became a sponsor because we love this project. We all use it here. Bitwarden.com slash DLN. We want to thank Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. Speaking of putting Bitwarden on all your devices, one of those devices we talk about all the time, putting it on is your cell phone. And in the news this week, we have some interesting things occurring with Ubuntu and Vodafone. One of the most commonly requested enhancements for the open source community, one of the things we all want desperately, especially me, is a true private, secure Linux-based phone. Not Android with Linux kernel and a bunch of Google crap on top, but a real Linux phone. And there are so many great emerging options out there, and they're starting to gain momentum. Of course, the Pine phone comes to mind. Uh, as one of those big ones. However, there's an interesting news development from Can Canonical talking about the testing of a partnership with Vodafone to create a cloud-based OS. So I know the first thing that comes to my mind anyways when I hear a cloud-based OS is security, <laughs> but we'll get into that in a second. Uh, the article states they're partnering to test a new technology that uses Anbox Cloud and the power of smart mobile networks to transform TVs, computers, wearables, and other everyday objects into cloud smartphones. This will be showcased to NWC 2022 with the prototype cloud smartphone. Uh, while this will run on the cloud, it is going to leave basic functionality of the device itself, like the camera, location, sensors on the device itself. So not everything's in the cloud. So think of some of the advantages like instant software updates and patches, which is one of the biggest issues with Android. Android is a massive security problem. And that's mm -hmm. because the software updates and the patches are often determined by the telecom and the manufacturer. Some support for two years, some support for one year, some support for three years, it's all over the board. So you may be sitting there with a phone that's completely unpatched. What do we say about Linux all the time? You gotta patch it, you gotta mm -hmm. do your updates. Well, a lot of cases, the user can't. They can't update their phone because the manufacturer and or telecom that they're working with doesn't release the patch is a major security problem in Android. So what I like about this idea of having your operating system in the cloud is that this would remove that as a potential problem, also advance workloads. So you could be far more productive on your phone because there's a lot more power in the cloud than it will be on your physical device. So those are some of the cool things about it. But again, that security thing, but well, we'll get into a second. Jill, what do you think about this? Oh, I think, I think this is a really <laughs> great option for Android to make it more secure. Absolutely. Because that has been a huge issue. And um, I like the fact that Canonical is uh, working on this. Because yeah. they, they actually have a really great track record with cloud and online services. And like they, they used to have uh, their Canonical had their Ubuntu One service. And I wish, wish that was still around it. It was a cloud-based file hosting service and music store that I used to sync files on all my computers, but the service ended in 2014. 
And Ubuntu One predated Google Drive by three years and was a great alternative to Dropbox. Right. And, you know, you could get a, a free Ubuntu One account for um, that had had five gigs of storage. And I just, I, that would be a nice feature to integrate with the Ubuntu Cloud phone. <laughs> this just proves, though, sometimes being first yeah. doesn't yeah. pay. There, yeah. there are many technologies out there where companies were first and they get rid of it because it doesn't seem like it's going to take off. And then later uh -huh. somebody else comes sudden, in when the time's yeah. right and it yeah. blows up. And yeah. Ubuntu with this seems like they were ahead of their time with this, unfortunately too far ahead of their time because it mm -hmm. would be a service they that were. I would sign up for today, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea of having the cloud-based operating system is interesting and also a little bit worrisome. Like, not to say that I don't, you know, I have an issue with Canonical or anything like that, but it's more of like the having the cloud-based operating system means that I have to trust them a lot more than I would normally if it's a local device. And we have situations right now where there's tons of issues of people having, the, even if they have an Android phone, where you don't even know, like depending on your manufacturer, depending on whatever kind of device you have, you don't even know if it's not sending data back. And even Google was caught sending, you know, sending data back to their to their servers, even even though they told you they weren't. So like there's there's already a situation where people are not really trusting of these kinds of things. So if I'm not sure if this is really the best option, especially I mean it, it's kind of nice in the fact that the Android apps would be running on their servers rather than mm -hmm. your phone. Yeah. That's an interesting approach. Let me tell to you it. something. DuckDuckGo released in beta, and they were so nice to give me a key for this. I have a video of it on my channel. It's still in beta. A lot of people were waiting for a key. I was lucky enough to get one, put it on my Android device. I thought, Mr. Privacy and Security here, that I had my phone pretty well wrapped up with the apps and things that I use. I used a lot of stuff through the browser and stuff. This DuckDuckGo is the it's basically taking the app tracking technology that Apple introduced on their phones that cost Facebook 40 billion plus dollars now in advertising losses. And they basically built that into DuckDuckGo browser. And so it basically sets up a proxy VPN so that all the apps go through that first in within DuckDuckGo when you install it and you sign up for the beta and captures all of the trackers in there. I had some apps in there and these were financial mm -hmm. banking apps that were doing something like 12 to 25,000 tracking attempts a day. I had apps that were just constantly pinging Google and Adobe ad services, literally relentlessly through the phone and things. Apps that I thought I trusted, apps that I paid for. So these weren't free apps on the app store. These are ones that I actually paid money for. They were just constantly trying to track. So Android's a disaster. It's a complete privacy disaster. I've been saying it for years. Maybe people, when they see the DuckDuckGo thing, will finally believe me. Um, but having all this stuff in the cloud, Michael, is interesting because all that tracking of those apps would be hitting the Ubuntu servers. And that would yeah, create a really powerful... Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some things they could do here that could make this something that I would really be interested in. Yeah. I would rather have all of my operating system stuff be on the device, but then have the Android like and box stuff in the cloud like that would be really nice because then all of the stuff that we couldn't you know we know that could have some potential issues would not be on your device like you're saying and i think that would be really really cool but i i do think that there's still an element of i this is not really available to most people right i'm pretty sure no, it's just it's for just enterprise. A concept yeah yeah okay so i think that this is really cool but i'm also looking kind of forward to something that's Along the same lines of this, you know, like Canonical making this is really interesting, but there's also another project that's making something similar that is uh, Wadroid. And mm -hmm. Wadroid yeah. is really cool because it's essentially a project that does this on your desktop, also on the uh, like Ubuntu Touch for the like the other the alternative phone devices. Yes. And I'm pretty sure Wadroid works on uh, Ubuntu Touch and post, post market OS already. And they're working on making it like improving it every day. And they also they're a project that actually has some funding because they do they did a crowdfunding thing to get people to work on it. So they have the paid developers to work on it, which is another example of why, you know, the the previous topic about the you know the freedom as in you know free as in freedom, not free as in beer kind of thing is an important topic because the more people that have funding to these these kinds of projects can do something as important, I think, as Wadroid is. So that's not to say that 
and box cloud isn't you know worth looking at i just think that it, this this approach is also really cool because it's being able to be applied to existing operating systems already and the fact that it's going to work on the the average desktop as well like that is really yeah, powerful. The integration. Like, now, someone in chat mentioned, "What if one of these Amblock Box Cloud instances where you have your phone OS got breached?" And I think that's an interesting point. But initially, originally, I thought, "Oh, that could be really bad." But if all of your local files and things are stored on your physical device, all your sensors, GPS, all that stuff stays there, then the only thing they would be breaching, essentially, hopefully, would be all your apps, but blank. So you would open up the app and have no, I mean, you could build it that way. That's how they should build it. Let me put it that way. If it's not, because in that case, even if it got breached, they would just be, they would have a list of all your apps, but none of the actual data, because that's not being stored in the cloud. That's that would be stored point. on the yeah. physical phone itself. Yeah. It's kind of like the whole root versus home folder kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe the roots, because all your data is stored. For those who don't know, on your Linux, all you have a home folder and the root folder. The root folder, the root is where your your programs are stored and all the configs and details for that. But your customizations for those programs and your files and your any of your images and stuff that you have on your computer are stored in a separate folder. And if they're doing that kind of approach, in theory, it would be like you're saying, it'd be just blank data that they wouldn't be able to get anyway. So that would be interesting. I'm curious how they're doing it because we don't have a lot of information about this because it is pretty new. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we get more about it when it goes forward. But I, I think that to it's, send us one of the Vodafones. Let's play with it. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> that that too. I think it's yeah. really cool as a concept though because I know not a lot of people are big fans of Android. However, there's a lot of applications that having access to those on your desktop or on this, you know, a third party operating system would be incredibly powerful. So I think it's really great that these projects exist. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really cool because this is, it, it's basically a thin, thin client now in your hand. <laughs> yeah, I agree though. I, I think that's a great point. Listen, as, as a privacy and security enthusiast, this and on one level scares me to death, but on another <laughs> level, I think there's some things that they could do here to make this actually superior to what we have today, far superior to what yes. we have today, if they implemented it correctly. It's the uh, the paradox of a privacy security enthusiast with a technology enthusiast at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. <there> we go. <laughs> and they're clashing over this right now in my head. Like, what if? What if? But I, I think there could be some good stuff here, and it'll be interesting to see what Canonical pulls off. I like they're creating partnerships here, I, even though it's mostly focused on enterprise potentially for people selling products and things. This stuff has a tendency to make its way to the consumer, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see where it goes. So if you thought Linux gaming was great before, the Steam Deck is making Linux cross the finish line and bringing Linux gaming to the world. Valve revealed Steam Deck support for Epic's easy anti-cheat software. This move means game developers have no excuse not to release their game on Linux. And we're proud to announce Linux now runs Apex Legends. Awesome. That is Woo pretty awesome. It's, I mean, AAA shooter shooter title, Battle Royale. I mean, this is huge for a lot of people. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's developed by Respawn Entertainment and published by Electronic Arts. And, yeah, so this is a AAA goodness in our hands. And it is actually the first AAA game with easy anti-cheat enabled on Linux. <laughs> So, so it does special. work. We've been lied yes. to before. It works yes. just fine, in fact. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as Ryan was saying, it's the most popular Battle Royale shooters and is now available on the, on our great operating system. And it's really a beautiful game. Honestly, the Gorgeous. animation re yeah. reminds me of the cell shading technique that the Borderlands series uses. Mm -hmm. I can see that. But, yeah. you know, it's a bit more subtle, but it has that look. And I've always liked the cell shaded effect. I think it's So, really Jill, cool. I have played <laughs> Apex Legends with my son, who's also a Fortnite fanatic. And Fortnite now has no excuse not to come to, to Linux, by the way. Uh, but I am <laughs> yeah. so bad at this game. The people... Like, I know I'm always bad at games. I can hear Matt now saying, hey, like, you're really bad at games. Uh, but this one is really challenging. The people that play this, there are so many dynamics to, first of all, there's this luck dynamic of what's going to spawn because you spawn with, you know, you've got to go get your equipment and try to find the right places to upgrade your equipment and get armor and all that type of stuff because it's a battle royale. Mm -hmm. And you got the shrinking map happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then you have these players who, I don't <laughs> know, they have no nothing else to do all day but play this game. And the second we would spawn in, we would just get 
taken out like immediately. And it took like a week before we actually <laughs> were able to get like a kill off, which means oh, okay. it, it was just far more difficult than Fortnite or any of the other battle royale mm -hmm. out there because there's just so much more strategy and things that go into mm. it. But it's a very cool game and I want us to play it on stream. Yeah, definitely. I want nice. us to stream this. Not because we want to show anybody we're good gamers, but the for exact them to opposite have, would happen. For the exact opposite. For them to get <laughs> yeah. some good laughs, get some popcorn yeah. out. You would enjoy the entertainment factor of it. Yeah. We're just going to get destroyed with the second we spawn in. Um, What's funny, because yeah. you're talking about this, I I have never played Apex Legends, so it'd be yeah. really interesting to kind of do that on the stream, especially like their first time playing it. But um, it reminds me of a kind of a first person more modern style of PUBG because I have played mm -hmm. PUBG oh, yeah. and I can yeah. tell you that I am not good at PUBG <laughs> but it's the, the way yeah. you're describing it <laughs> is the exact same feeling I have where Very I go in like PUBG yeah, yeah I go into the game and I you know try to find all the weapons and whatnot I spend 20 minutes getting all the equipment and then I go into a battle and immediately lose that is the experience that I have for PUBG, so I assume that sounds very similar. <laughs> yeah. to <the laughs> well, it's kind of like you yeah. sit there and you you get all loaded up if you do get a chance to play for five minutes before you get killed, and then you go to shoot somebody and you're like, you know, their their backs to you or something, so you're really hitting them with a bunch of bullets, and then they somehow still have time to turn around, shoot once, kill you, and keep going about their way. It's <laughs> that type of stuff where yeah. you know there's some dynamic to this <laughs> yeah. game that I don't understand that they do. Um, but okay. those are the kind of moments I had in, in Apex. But it's a fun game. I mean, it's if you could get good at it, but I think it would be fun for people to watch us die yeah, in it. I'm looking lot. forward yeah. to it, and I think we need to do that You know, pretty soon. Yeah, like next definitely. Week. Yeah. I yeah, was really absolutely. impressed with the sound effects, especially with all the different weapons. I mean, they were on the level of Half-Life sounding <laughs> bullets yeah, coming really out of the guns. Yeah. And I really had fun shooting targets in the training video, but has just started playing the main campaign, so... <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to play it with you guys. I think that would be really, really fun. Michael's going to have a problem <laughs> because uh, eighty-one gigabytes is required for this game. Yes, absolutely. What? So make sure to have yeah. enough uh, hard drive space available. <laughs> Michael, you're going to have to delete all those selfies of yourself for at least no. from twenty twelve that you keep. Because I know you keep selfies for. I would uh, never delete those selfies. In fact, I'll yeah. put them on my NAS just for good storage. You know that that you move, make sure move I your never. To your NAS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, <laughs> okay, we can't lose such important data. Uh, yeah. But uh, it is kind of funny you make that joke about the 81 gigs being a problem for me uh, because it would be. I have like yeah, 25 have gigs shows. left. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you have shows you have to selfies. stream and record. Well, I, yeah. that's see, Jill. What Jill is saying is real. <laughs> what Ryan is saying is nonsense. It's selfies yeah. and pictures of stools, no. like all the various stools it's he the, found online. It's the source data for the episodes when I do the editing for them. Mm. I store all the data, so I have tons and tons of gigs of the show. Right. So yeah. that's the actual reason. Yeah. Let me help you out in the software spotlight, Michael, because the software oh, spotlight is a tool called File Shredder. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. And so this is what you need to use to get rid of some of these files on there, File Shredder, so you can securely get rid of some of these selfies and things. Uh, some people also call this Raider. It's a simple application. It enables you to securely delete files. We've talked about the shred command in prior episodes, but this is a nice, simple to use GUI interface for that shredder uh, nice. shred command there. You simply drag and drop files, add them or add them from your file manager, and it's going to use the Gutman wipe method, which is an algorithm for securely erasing the files on your drives. So it achieves a complete erase by repeatedly writing 35 segments in the sectors that it's looking to erase there. So much more secure than a standard just delete, which we know doesn't actually remove things off mm -hmm. um, until something's written into that segment or sector. Yeah. So this is a much better way to use it. So get rid of your selfies and the pictures of stools and stuff with File Shredder, Michael. Well, okay, so this would not solve the problems of things I want to keep. Therefore, the <laughs> selfies would not be even touch this thing. But for things that I do delete, I actually have a process of deleting because there's a lot, you know, there's the delete to uh, move to trash or just fold permanent delete. But even when you do a permanent delete, it's not really a full delete. Right. It just tells the system <laughs> okay, pretend that this doesn't exist. And so you can still e easily overwrite it. So it kind of gives you a, like a false sense of delete. This would be great for those things because I, c I constantly have a need to do the permanent delete because I do them all the time. I actually delete permanently 
more than I do move to trash, which is not necessarily something I would recommend to most people. It's just that's the thing that I've started doing. Mm-hmm. But yeah. this file shredder could be used for that. And I do want to say one thing. When you first mentioned file shredder, I was <laughs> absolutely hoping that its icon looked a little different. Not saying that this is a bad icon. It's not okay. a bad icon. But okay. the vi- for the for the people who are watching the video version, you can see what I was hoping. That it's something like what they have for this. I would love to have a shredder as in Nin- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles shredder icon. It seems like the an icon. obvious missed opportunity, right? right? Yeah, yeah, it'd be so good. It'd be so good. This is just a you know a, a quick tip. Maybe to think about it if you want, but still, thank you for the software. <laughs> I, I like that you put you <laughs> took our advice earlier and said thank yeah. you, but also requested they change their icon to a what '90s cartoon? A yeah. '90s <laughs> cartoon <laughs> reference. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So Ryan, if we put Michael AI in the shredder, it would be wiped from existence for good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's not do it. Let's we not do that. We need to test to see can't. how good the shredder does. Like we yeah. need to find yeah. out. Let's put it in there. <laughs> yeah, is that it reminds me of that Terminator scene where they crush the circuit chip or whatever in the Terminator movies, something like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, exactly. You know, another uh, piece of advice, Michael, is the 4K TikToks that you have. Maybe you could get rid of those and free up space for Apex. <laughs> See, you keep giving suggestions that are just not practical to remove those things. <laughs> okay. But I yeah. guess the TikToks, I could, okay, maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. on the TikToks. Uh, we'll All put right. it in the maybe list for sure. Thanks. <laughs> anyway, so let's move on to the tip of the week, where this is a serious re- 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 comment, not just this nonsense that Ryan comes up with. Nonsense? How dare you? <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so the tip of the week this week, we're going to talk about cups and printing on Linux. And this is a really interesting tip because Ryan asked me a, like earlier in the week, like, hey, have you heard of this kind of thing you can do with cups? And the answer for the... Uh, no, I did not. So this tip <laughs> is a tip that I did not know until this show. So thank you, Ryan. So well, many people in Linux are familiar with cups or common user... Common Unix... Y- Unix. How did I mess that up? Many people in Linux are familiar with CUPS or common use Unix printing system. I almost did it again. However, one thing you may have noticed is that accessing CUPS by default requires root permissions depending on how you want to access it. So what if I told you you could fix this by just adding your user to the LP admins group? So LP admin is a command line tool used to configure printer and class queues provided by CUPS. So it's sudo user mod dash A dash capital G uh, space LP admin, un- then the next thing is username to add your username to the group for using the user mod thing. We'll have the full details of exactly what to do in the show notes. And you can also, to make the change, you can use your favorite text editor and do it inside of the Etsy cups, cups D dot config file, as well as then you'll have to do a, a change for their system service for the system control restart cups dot service. All of this information, I know I kind of just we went that really quickly. That will all be in the show notes. So you don't have to worry about exactly what it is. I'll have the full details right there. The important part is you no longer have to use the root stuff. You can just use your regular user to get rid of print jobs, to add printers yeah. and things like there by just adding to the LP admin. You will need to do that system CTL restart cups.service thing or else you won't notice the change. You'll make that, that change add to that group and then you'll go to mess with the printer and you'll still need to put your root stuff in there, but it's a good way to get rid of it. And I found a lot of people who've been in Linux a long time didn't know that mm-hmm. was a possibility there. Yeah, I didn't know that because I always, when I used printers, which is rarely, when I use printers, I use the USB connector, so it would just do it automatically. But if this is for like a networking kind of approach, right? Yeah, yep, networking your printers mm-hmm. and Wi-Fi and things. Absolutely. Yeah, I used to use it in my school classroom for all my workstations that were connected to the printers. And it works really well. And Ryan, I tested tested your code yesterday, and it was brilliant. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. It works. Then we can put it in the Michael AI. I mean, now yeah. Michael AI will be really advanced and help you but fix some services. But I didn't come yes. up with that tip. Yeah. That would yeah, be a Ryan matter. AI. Yeah, now you know it, though, so we have to well, add it okay. to the AI. Everything you learn, we have to add to the we AI. We're to... up to 140 lines of code. <gasps> no, that's 141 oh. right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For those who don't know, on my GitHub, there is a Michael AI program you can go play with right there. I have taken the most sophisticated programming <laughs> techniques available to me and have duplicated Michael's brain in the software. So go check it out. Yeah. I mean, it's uncanny, really. It's uncanny, you, the yeah. resemblance. Yeah. <laughs> you read the, the comments that are in there, that the things that it can do, 
it it's just it just seems like it's me. Unbelievable. In, it's gonna in a the program. World. Yeah, it's, it's gonna <laughs> change the world. <laughs> Speaking of changing the world, you may want to go to a conference. And Durhans has hooked us up this week with the conferences that you need to get prepped for coming up. We have FOSS Asia in April, April 7th through the 9th. So that's coming up here real soon. Linux Fest Northwest, April 22nd through the 24th. And that's both of those are virtual, by the way. So you can join from anywhere. We have PinguiCon, April 22nd through the 24th. Linux App Summit. April 29th through the 30th. Red Hat Summit would be a fun one. May 10th through the 11th. That's virtual. And Scale in personal virtual July 28th through the 31st. So check out those conferences. You can join them virtually, a lot of these now this year, which is a huge advantage if you're never able to make it out to them in the past. But other than that, I want to give a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. We're here every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern live at DLNlive.com. And the best part, everyone is invited to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week. And we can't wait to see you in the chat. We also have our glorious patrons with us in the virtual stadium. They join us in, like, at the beginning of the show. We have a quick pre-show. We also have the po patron post-show. But they also get the unedited versions of the show. And they, we, we post them every week after the show. And But the best, the, absolutely the best thing, is that they get to hang out with us in the patron post-show, which is in our 60,000, actually 75,000 square foot digital it grew. stadium. Wow. It grew yeah. again. Yes, absolutely. And that happens immediately following the show. So become a patron by going to destinationlinux.com org slash Patreon. You can also do it on destinationlinux.org slash sponsors if you prefer to use that platform. And another thing you should check out is the DLN store. We mentioned it earlier in the show because it just happened to fit perfectly, but you can also get a lot of great stuff at the store, including the hat that Ryan is very clearly pointing out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's so much great stuff. There's there's ho hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, stickers, desk mats, coasters, all sorts of stuff. Check it out at dealinstore.com. And make sure to check out all the amazing shows here on the Destination Linux Network. We have the Pseudo Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, Linux Out Loud, Hardware Addicts, GameSphere, and put your cowboy hats on and join our Saturday Linux user group, Linux Saloon. Everyone head to destinationlinux.network and subscribe to all these great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching and the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. So everybody have a wonderful week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important at, as the destination. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. We got a great comment in the live chat, by the way. Ryan says, uh, Velocity says they just starred Michael AI on GitHub. So Nice. Yes. <laughs> nice. Will, will be my most popular package ever <laughs> written.